Now today we're going to learn a little bit about uh, this molecule here, this uh, crazy complex looking piece of molecular architecture which is called strychnine, which no doubt you probably well have heard of. It's a, a well-known poison. These days it's used for killing rats. But in the past it was a, a medicinal compound, especially in the Victorian era. So at that point in time uh, it was used for all sorts of ailments like headaches. It was a, one of the very first athletic performance enhancers, believe it or not. And of course it's, it's a poison. It's really not useful in any of these respects whatsoever. It comes from the, the seeds of a tree in the Philippines and over hundreds of years the Filipinos had used the extracts of this bean, as they called the seed, to treat various ailments. So it was a, a sort of herbal type of medicine. And it works on the nervous system, so it'll give you a bit of a tingle, um, obviously in high doses, or, or actually not that high doses, um, it, it, it'll have very severe effects on you. But if, if something, you take something that interacts with your body, you get a bit of a tingle and perhaps you feel it like it's doing good rather than harm. So in small quantities, uh, it, it was used for centuries, but actually it's, it's got no real beneficial effect uh, as a medicine. And indeed, you know, famously it's been used uh, in all sorts of murder mystery cases. I have just one story about strychnine, but I really like it. Just before I started as a PhD student, a Brazilian professor visiting the chemistry department took some strychnine out of the store because he wanted to poison his wife. But being a professor, he was a bit absent-minded and he mislaid the strychnine. He lost it. And he got really worried that somebody might get poisoned other than his wife. So he went to the police and admitted everything. And then the strychnine was found in his jacket pocket hanging in his wardrobe. So his wife was safe. What happened to the professor? I have no idea. One of the founders of Stanford University was poisoned by strychnine, murdered by strychnine, and her last words were that this is the most horrible and painful death. In fiction, it's been used a lot. In Agatha Christie, three or four novels of hers had strychnine. In, in the Grand Budapest Hotel, it's in there as a, as a poison. Actually, there hasn't been many deaths or murders through the use of strychnine, uh, luckily. So this was uh, given to us by Sigma Aldrich uh, for the use in uh, the periodic videos. So thank you very much to them. Yeah, there's about a gram in here and it takes about 10 to 50 milligrams to, to kill a human being. This tree gives uh, beautiful white flowers, uh, very fragrant smelling, um, but presumably it's in there to stop animals from eating the seeds. You know, the animal takes a, a bite of it and doesn't finish its meal. Like many of the compounds that I talk about, it works on the nervous system. It means that you, all your muscles go out of control and you know you die of asphyxiation of uh, not being able to breathe because your lungs aren't working properly. Imagine it as a, a series of electrical cables with junction boxes in between. And at the ends you've got sensors and muscles at the other end. So sensors build up using ions, a concentration of, of positive charge uh, using generally sodium, potassium, calcium ions. That then fires an electrical charge down the, the cable to the other end and then calcium ions allow the release of neurotransmitters to go and tell the muscle or the brain or whatever is on the other end what to do. So this interferes with that process at the junction boxes. Uh, so this inhibits uh, both sodium and chlorine ion channels, which is unusual. Normally a molecule will interact with just one type of receptor, whereas this, this interacts with two types of receptor. How does it actually get there? Yeah, that's a good question. So if, if you ingest something, it will go obviously into your, your gut. Once it's in the gut, it can then pass through the gut to blood barrier. It needs to be yeah. charged to do that, so we've got a basic amine on here. It then gets into your bloodstream and the bloodstream then transports it around your body. This uh, obviously with the blood will go to all your muscles and start to interfere with any uh, neuromuscular junctions that, that it comes across. It's not a very good murder weapon because it will stay in the body for years, traces of it, so it will be very easily identifiable. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, it's a new one to us. What does strychnine taste like? Um, well, they say it tastes bitter, and, and uh, on strychnine, uh, there's this tertiary amine here, this, this blue atom. Uh, and anything with a tertiary amine always tastes incredibly bitter. A lot, lot of insects have uh, these tertiary amine molecules on, on 
the back so that they taste horrible. So a bit like um, licking a brass or a copper spoon. Yeah, really bitter and ugh, really not very pleasant at all. So again, not, not the best poison because you, you're going to taste it in your cup of tea. <laughs> Here we are, we'll open the bag. The uh, <clears throat> high security containment system and just take a, a little look at what strychnine looks like. So there we have the top. It's not a lot in here actually. I was maybe a, maybe 100 milligrams, not not a gram at all. Let's just take that. There we go. So there we go. Just uh, a white powder essentially. Looks fairly innocuous. I mean, the majority of chemicals that we work with are not toxic. Uh, there may be it worse so-called harmful, maybe slightly corrosive. The majority are, are, are not that way at all. I wouldn't want my PhD students to, to work with anything that's extremely toxic. Um, although we have made a few natural products <coughs> over the years which, which are, are really quite potent. But this is quite a dangerous substance and, and not something that the likes of which we would normally be working with. I look at that and I think, wow, that's beautiful such a, a really unique architecture all of these ring systems you've got hydrogens pointing into this cavity here seven membered rings five membered rings six membered rings all sorts of different molecular architectural pieces in there and, and for the synthetic chemist that makes this an absolutely outstanding challenge this is the everest if you like of the total synthesis type of world so it was isolated by two french chemists in 1818, so you know, nearly 200 years ago now. Uh, and it was about 120 years later by the time chemists had figured, finally figured out what the, on earth the structure was, because it's just so complex. So there were over 100, 250 papers attempting to find out what the structure of strychnine was. And eventually in 1947, uh, two chemists, uh, Robert Robinson, who was later became Sir Robert Robinson at Oxford University, he proposed the correct structure, and uh, Lukes, and a completely separate chemist, also did. But Rob Robinson was very famous in his day, and this was the culmination of, of two decades' worth of work in his laboratories. Seven years later, Robert Burns Woodward was the first uh, group to synthesise it, and. Uh, Robinson had said, for its molecular size, it's the most complex molecule ever known. Since Woodward's original synthesis, there's been 17 further syntheses. So 1954 was the first synthesis, so there's around 28 synthetic steps, so different things that you had to do, and the yield was minuscule. It was, uh, they were starting from tens of kilos and getting milligrams out. Oh, 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 six percent yield, which is a very small amount. And, and quite a lot of steps, 28 steps, actually is, is for the, the complexity of this molecule is, is still quite competitive. The next synthesis was uh, carried out in 1992, so it was you know, many years later, uh, by Philip Magnus. That was again 28 steps, but he, he got it up to 0.03% yield. It's considerably uh, more efficient, about a thousand times more efficient, but still a very low yield. In each case, um, all of these people uh, were developing a new type of bond connection connecting reaction and they are putting that into operation. So Magnus in, in his synthesis was making this bond and this bond in the key step using a Dill's order type of reaction. Uh, Woodward had used uh, um, obviously the, the synthetic chemistry of the day and, and you know 40 years had passed by the time Magnus uh, came to doing it. In 1994 was the next synthesis and that one then went up to 3% yield using Larry Overman's chemistry. And these are all, you know, incredible. These are the, the rock stars of the organic chemistry world that are coming to play here. Uh, so uh, time moves on. 2007, Padua got it down to 16 steps, 2% yield. By 2011, we had the shortest synthesis ever. Nine steps by Chris van der Waal. Terrible yield. There was one really difficult step in there. But nine steps when you think the original was 28. Um, it's quite incredible and probably the best synthesis out there is by David Macmillan. 12 steps but 6% yield, so considerably stronger and 1,000 times more efficient 
in the original synthesis. And this is the progress that organic chemistry has made. Not only in structural elucidation, so 20 years worth of work in the 1930s and 40s, 250 papers to determine the structure of this. Today, one of my PhD students would be able to determine the structure in an afternoon because spectroscopic techniques have, have come an incredibly long way. There were almost none back in 1946. We had infrared. There was an x-ray of this in 1952, so that was one of the very first x-rays, but in 1946 that didn't exist. So back then they had to uh, literally chemically react it and figure out what uh, bonds would have been broken through that uh, type of reaction. So it was a real detective story back then using evidence, chemical evidence, to determine structure, whereas now we can use spectroscopy. What's going to happen to that now? Well, I'll put some of that back in the bottle and the rest will have will destroy. And then what, it'll just sit on a shelf for a rainy uh, day? It'll sit in a locked cupboard, yeah. <laughs> just in case we get some rats in the, uh, the lab. Uh, but every few seconds your brain's saying breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. It, it does it automatically. Or, or move your muscles. So if you stop any of those signals, then obviously your muscles stop. And if you stop breathing, you're going to die pretty quick.